All right. Hey, everybody. How's it going? It's your brother Noah. May God bless you guys in Jesus' name. Today in this video, I wanted to encourage the saints of God. I wanted to start off by saying something that might be a little shocking to some of you. And that is, at the end of the day, it is okay to feel like sometimes you have not done enough for God, that you haven't done enough good deeds for the sake of God's kingdom. I also want to start off this video by saying, that the word of God says we should be zealous for good works. Yes, most definitely. Titus 2.14 says that Jesus Christ gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. So yes, we should be zealous of good works as Christians. But I want to remind you, although you may already be aware of this, and if not, tell you, that it is ex exponentially more important in the heart and mind of God uh, concerning our sanctification than doing good works. Our sanctification, becoming like Jesus Christ, conforming to the image of God's Son, is dramatically more important than the amount of good works that we do, especially the amount of good works that we do on a day-to-day focus or on a day-to-day -day emphasis. Now, I titled this video, What to Do When You Feel Lukewarm, and I wanted to read a couple verses out of the passage that talks about being lukewarm. Revelation chapter 3 verse 15 says, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou that thou wert cold or hot. Now, I wanted to point out that in this passage, Jesus is not saying that they don't have good works. Jesus is not saying that they don't have works or works for the sake of the kingdom of God. Actually, he says, I know thy works, you know, implying that they do have works. Now, sometimes the word works in the Bible refers to the moral character, you know, the state of somebody's actions um, as opposed to, you know, specifically doing good works, doing ministry, uh, doing things for the sake of the kingdom of God. But nevertheless, also we see in, um, you know, Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3, Jesus addresses other churches and commends them on their patience, their labor, the works that they have, but then goes on to rebuke them about other things where they have disobedience. So I find it not a far off conclusion if we're you know, looking at the context of the passage and how Jesus is speaking to other churches to look at the word works in that fashion. And if we look at more of the context, we see that, you know, the Laodiceans being lukewarm has a lot more to do with their heart disposition. In verse 17, it says, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Jesus was rebuking their internal heart disposition. And obviously, actually, they had to have not been lazy individuals. They had to have not been not doing any kind of, uh, you know, good works or works that are commendable because the Laodiceans were saying that they are rich and increased with goods. So obviously, these are not lazy people. You know, when we read this, it's easy to think, to look at it through the lens of, we just need to do more good things. And if we're not doing a set amount of good things, that that means that we're lukewarm like the Laodiceans. But once again, once you take all these things into consideration, I think you can look at what is being lukewarm look like in a little bit of a different perspective. So by this passage, if you want to look at somebody who's lukewarm, biblically speaking, this is in reference to somebody who's no longer poor in spirit. This is in reference to somebody who's no longer desperate for the things of God that is self-sufficient. This is the state of the Laodiceans that is being rebuked, that they were self-sufficient, that they thought that they had need of nothing, but in reality, they were miserable, poor, blind, wretched, and naked. And something that I want to say is that as you continue on in your Christian walk, as you step into more ministry, as you grow spiritually, you may actually do less things in some sense. You may take less good opportunities, but yet bear more fruit. I can definitely see this in my Christian walk, that when I first became born again, 
I was jumping at like almost any kind of opportunity to do some kind of ministry. And that's a great heart disposition to have. I think God really honors that zeal. But now there's actively opportunities where I could do ministry that I decline, that I don't take those opportunities. But yet, by the grace of God, I'm able to reach more people. I'm able to communicate the word of God more effectively. I'm able to see more people repent and believe in Christ. I'm able to see more people get delivered. Um, there is more fruit being born in the efforts of my ministry, in the efforts of my life, for the sake of the kingdom of God now, even though in the beginning I was just like ready to jump on any kind of opportunity to do something for the sake of the kingdom of God. And it, you know, in some sense, it's awesome to be in both states, to be freshly born again and to have that excitement to just do anything. But, you know, as you grow in Christ, Christ prunes you, Christ grows you so that you can be more effective and strive less in the flesh strive less in your own ability to get things done and when that's the case you actually end up bearing more fruit for the sake of the kingdom of god and i believe a good passage that talks about this is john chapter 15 verse 2 through 5 it says every branch in me that beareth not fruit he taketh away every branch that beareth fruit he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except ye abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. So why does Jesus Christ keep making these statements in this passage? Without me, you can do nothing. The branch can bear, cannot bear fruit of itself at all because Christians are going to be faced with this mentality of trying to do things by themselves, trying to accomplish things, but yet not abiding in the leading direction and timing of the Holy Spirit. And I wanted to highlight what Jesus Christ said here, uh, more so towards the beginning of the passage. Every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So you as a Christian, you're zealous. If you are in Christ, you are zealous. You are, you know, wanting to do God's will. And you're actually bearing fruit. You're bearing fruit for the kingdom of God. But you know what God does? He purges you. He refines you. And sometimes that purging and refining comes right in the middle of when you're trying to do things for the sake of the kingdom of God. What a great time to be sanctified. What a great time for you to grow in being poor in spirit and realizing that it's not by your own wisdom or efforts that you're going to get things done. God specifically has this, uh, uh, this pruning happen when you're bearing fruit. And think about it. Um, I have a garden in my backyard, and my wife just recently... Uh, you know, pruned away some of the branches because it's going gonna, it's gonna to drop into freezing temperatures here soon. So that fruit that wasn't actually going to come to fruition got cut away. And, uh, you know, I was like, uh, initially like, uh, kind of discouraged or kind of like, you know, to some small degree, um, like, oh man, that sucks. But realizing that that fruit, um, you know, that is actually going to come to fruition is going to come to fruition more fastly. Uh, more quickly as opposed to, you know, um, just letting everything all grow together and maybe none of that fruit comes to fruition, right? So I hope you guys, if you need to even read through John chapter 15 right here, Jesus Christ will prune you. He will purge you so that you bring forth more fruit. And once again, you may already be bringing forth fruit, but then you're going to bring forth more fruit. And that can happen right in the middle of you trying to do things for God, just to further show that it's only by his power, it's only by his strength, his wisdom, that things are going to be accomplished. Once again, I just want to say that I think God specifically, intentionally takes us through that sanctification process when we're trying to minister, when we're trying to do things for the sake of the kingdom of God, just to further Make it a fact that no flesh 
would glory in his presence. Well, no flesh will glory in his presence, but that no child of God would take credit for the works that they have done. And something else that I want to say here is that there can be a lot of self-idolatry when you're serving God, idolatry of your ministry, idolatry of the things that you've done. And you know what ends up happening, and maybe is a temptation for all of us at certain points to certain degrees, is that your source of joy comes from your obedience. Your source of joy should not be primarily or merely coming from your obedience. Now, yes, of course, it is scriptural that when we obey God, we feel joy. We have that joy. Anybody who's walking in obedience to Christ, which I hope 100% of the people watching this video are, know that when you do the right thing, when you submit to God, when you don't lie, when you don't cheat, when you don't steal, and you have to deny yourself and do the right thing, you feel so much joy afterwards. Yes and amen to that. That happens in my life, and I'm not trying to discredit that. But at the end of the day, your joy should come from the finished work of Jesus Christ. Your joy... You know, your happiness should come from what God is doing in your life and not merely based on if you do all the right things in a day. Because then otherwise you're going to be up and down like a roller coaster. You might, you know, cross all the T's, dot all the I's, so to speak, one day. And then the next day you didn't pray as you ought. You, you know, didn't um, read the word of God. You didn't, uh, you know, do X, Y, or Z. And uh, you just, and if you feel so down in that situation, and yes, in some sense, when we're not doing what we ought, we should be grieved. We should be grieved. So really try to understand what I'm saying right here because it requires discernment to make the distinction of what I'm saying. You know, we should be able to get to the point where, hey, even on the days where I didn't do the best, even on the days where I wasn't as consistent as I should be, I can still rejoice I can still rejoice in the work God is doing in my life and the work that Jesus Christ has done on the cross. Because trusting in your ability to perform and to get things done, putting too much emphasis in that or any trust in that at all altogether can actually sabotage you from bearing fruit. You know, to give an example of this, when you are first born again, let's say, you take 30 opportunities. You take every opportunity that is presented to you that seems good. But then when you grow in Christ, you might take 5 or 10 or let's say even 15 of those opportunities. But those 5, 10 or 15 opportunities, you bear, you bear way more fruit in the things that you do in that situation. You could take all 30 of those opportunities and your attention is so divided and you are so you know, focused on what you need to get done, that you don't be led by the Holy Spirit, that there's not fruit born in any of those things at the end of the day. Now, the unconverted, um, somebody who's lazy or somebody who's unconverted altogether, will take advantage of what I'm saying of like, oh, Brother Noah's saying that we can just, you know, just get by and just do a couple things for God, just take a couple opportunities, and we don't really need to be zealous for God. Of course, that's not what I'm saying. Of course, that's actually the opposite of what I'm saying. But nevertheless, I want to communicate the truth to the saints of God. I'm not going to allow, you know, sinners who may take advantage of what I'm saying to blockade me from, you know, speaking the truth to the saints of God, that they should abide in Christ and bear more fruit by allowing Christ to sanctify you, allowing the Holy Spirit to lead you. And I wanted to you know, finish off pretty much with this passage right here. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 says, For ye see your calling, brethren, that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of this world to confound the things which are mighty, and the base things of this world, and those which are despised, yea, God hath chosen and the things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, of who God, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. If at, end, at the end of the day, you're doing something for God, you're doing ministry, and you can put credit to yourself and what you did, you're, you're doing that in the flesh. God so works in us 
that in the things that we do, we have to give all glory to God. You know, even just in our analyzing of the situation of like, there's no way that that could have been done except God moved, except the Holy Spirit moved. You know, this is the will of God. I believe that all of the works that we do as Christians, um, that we would not be able to, not only theoretically, but not that practically, that no flesh would glory in God's presence, right? You know, the Word of God does talk about people who have certain works and they build on a wrong foundation, that those, that those works be built up on the judgment day. Just think how many people, maybe genuine Christians that love God, but a lot of the works, a lot of the ministry they do, it'll be burnt up on the judgment day because they did it for the wrong reason. They did it with the wrong heart intention. And even with that being said, I'm not saying that you have to have no temptations, no evil thoughts come across your mind or heart uh, that you need to resist when you're doing the will of God. So I don't want to keep condemnation on people uh, on the other end of that discussion. But nevertheless, I hope that you guys, guys get what I'm saying there. And here's one last thing that I want to communicate to you. And this ties in with the ministry of deliverance. I tell people this all the time. Do not underestimate what God will do in you and through you um, over a long period of time and consistency. You might have a day that doesn't seem fruitful. You might have a week, a month that doesn't seem fruitful. And once again, I'm not talking about, hey, unfruitfulness in the sense of you're just, you know, living like a heathen. You're just uh, rebelling against God. But where you're like genuinely trying to sow into the kingdom of God, genuinely trying to minister to people, genuinely trying to better your life, your family. And it just seems like a day, a week, a month, like where's the fruit? You know, a, over a long period of time, you will really see that fruit come to fruition. Does not the word of God, does not the New Testament specifically encourage us over and over and over again that God will bring forth 30, 60, 100 fold. But it doesn't look like it in the moment a lot of the time. A lot of the times it doesn't look like it, but you have to walk by faith and not by sight. And um, God will really, you know, do a lot if you abide in Christ, even though it might seem like less is being done. You know, it can seem like to the flesh you're getting more done if you don't abide in Christ. You can hastily try to work through things in your flesh and seemingly have more fruit short term, but long term, <laughs> there's no fruit. And opposite is the case. When you abide in Christ, it can seem like there's not fruit being born but in actuality, that's where the most fruit is being born. Amen. So God bless you guys in Jesus' name. Amen.